Good morning again, church. It's a delight and pleasure to be with you. My mama's in the crowd this morning. Hey, mama. So, I'll tell you right now, if I say something out of line, you better believe I'm going to hear it. I get my boldness from my mama. My stepfather's here. who's a hero of mine. I'm so glad he's here. So, welcome to church, guys. Let's join our hearts in prayer as we ask the Holy Spirit to renew our minds and God willing, transform our lives too. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this special place, a place we can truly call home, a place where we can bring all our doubt, shame, fear, and shortcomings, that we bring it to your cross and that you took it for us. For all of us who have faith in your son, Jesus. So may the words of my mouth and collective meditation of our hearts bring new life to everyone we encounter and everyone we see. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I'm really captivated by this letter to the Romans. And I mean it when I say this. I'm grateful to serve a church that's committed to reading throughout the entire year one particular book of the Bible. And this year, we're in the book of Romans. Bar none, the best way to read the Bible, church, is book by book. I also love studying this letter. And a couple interesting facts about Paul's writing is that his biblical letters averaged around 1,300 words. Averaged about 1,300 words, but in his letter to the Romans, he writes 7,000 words, making it the longest letter we have from the ancient world, and also suggesting to us that we should probably pay super close attention to it. As you've heard already, it's a letter and a book that will bring new life. And I believe that with all my heart because here's the thing. When this letter is read through the lens of love and freedom in Christ, it's infectious. Because this letter to the Romans is so invested in the transformation of our hearts. And only Christ can transform it. And I believe that from Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18, through Romans chapter 3, ending in verse 20, Paul is systematically articulating a theological foundation for us by leveling the playing field for everyone. He's leveling the playing field for everyone. So let's turn to the Word of God in Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 16 of our Bibles. We'll go through the section of the letter in two different parts, and we'll start with verses 1 through 11. Romans 2, verses 1 through 11. It's also on the screen. Here's the Word of God. This is where the power is, church. You, therefore... Have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. And now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, Do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. When his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. 
To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then to the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. This is the word of the Lord, church. Thanks be to God. So friends, Paul was brilliant at preaching appropriately to the culture and context of his day. Of course, the master of this type of teaching was Jesus himself. It's why he preached in parables. He preached in parables because it reached the very core of people's souls. There's something about a story that'll wrap itself around people's hearts. And in thinking of Jesus and his preaching, I couldn't help this week but think about the story of the prodigal son found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. Really because last week in chapter 1 we addressed the younger son. And this week in Romans 2, 1 through 16, we're addressing the older son. If you remember, he's the good and moral son. And let me just be clear about something when it comes to the good and moral son and the younger prodigal son. My prayer for every young person I encounter, including my own children, is that they come to know Jesus at a young age, know his love and his grace and his mercy so they can tell a story when when they look back at their past, they don't have a lot of wreckage. Sometimes we romanticize the story of the younger prodigal son. And that doesn't need to be the story for everyone. It's actually more common to be the older son. And I want my prayer for the next generation to say, I knew and found the love of Christ young, and I've never looked back. I want Ariana preaching on the corner post road with me in 10 years. Let's go. (laughs) Post corner pizza, baby. Greek salad. Delicious. Just saying. So with this preaching style in mind, church, we're aware that Paul knows he's teaching to a Jewish people who could be prideful and judgmental about their status as a chosen people. That was their thing. They were a chosen people. So he knew that in mind when he was teaching them, that they believed they were chosen. So let's address three points from this section. Here's the first point. Who is the you referring to in the opening of verse 1? Who's the you referring to in the opening of verse 1? Well, last week Paul preached to the immoral Gentiles. And this week he's turning his attention to the Jews. But to be clear, the way chapter 2 begins is very significant. Chapter 2 starts with the word you, and the relevance of today's teaching from Paul is that you refers not just to the Jews, but to you and me as well. There is a message for you and me as well. As a matter of fact, the you is referring to any person that reads chapter 1, verses 18 through 32 and says, you know what? Look at those godless people. I'm nothing like them. That's who Paul is addressing. Here's the second point. What is Paul communicating in verse 2 when the Bible says, Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. What does Paul mean by truth in this section? This is where Paul has just disqualified human beings from having the role of ultimate judge. 
And he does this because in verse 1 he says, if you judge anyone, you're condemning yourself. If you've ever judged somebody in your life, raise your hand. Yes, church. Way to go. Guys, this is God's brilliant design stating clearly that our participation in sin excludes us for being qualified to ultimately judge anybody. And with this framework in mind, we are able to conclude that only God is capable of having the role of ultimate judge because his judgment is based on truth. And the truth from scripture this morning is talking about God's word and character. God's word is where the power is. And his character is where the mercy is. In other words, God will judge fairly according to his righteousness standards. Thanks be to God for that, but it also means we're all guilty. Paul is once again leveling the playing field. And here's the really good news. We we see in verse 4 about God's word and character that we can rest in the fact that placing our faith in Jesus the Christ means that God's judgment for our sin was placed on him and that we could receive Jesus' perfect record. Bless you. That message is vital, guys, for the world. In a world that strives to be perfect and have it all together, Paul is saying, no, there's one that was perfect. His name is Jesus, and it's through repentance and faith in Christ you will receive mercy. Third point. God does not show favoritism. God does not show favoritism. Verse 11, guys, is principally about the Jews' conviction that they were the favored nation of people and would be judged differently than others. Jews believed that they had a different status with God, and Paul was concerned about this because ultimately that sort of thinking is presuming on God's mercy. Paul was concerned about this, and he knew it was a serious problem. He knew that their thinking led them to assume that they could do whatever they want because of their chosen status. So what does Paul do? He uses some strong language to address this. Because here's the thing. When you love somebody so much sometimes you got to use some strong language sometimes you got to look somebody in the eye and tell them the truth and paul is doing that right now in verse 5 because he says because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of god's wrath when his Righteous judgment will be revealed. Imagine that being said to someone who thought that they were differently selected than others. And he's saying, you got it wrong. And so Paul is teaching the Gentiles and Jews that sin must lead to repentance because through repentance, we receive the mercy of God. Church, repentance is the bridge to freedom. Repentance is the bridge to mercy. Repentance is the bridge to new life. And it's accessible to everybody. You know, when I think that God doesn't show favoritism, I also think about how we were all created for a unique, specific purpose in the world. Regardless of gifts and talents and abilities, whether we're a Jew or Gentile, 
male or female, black or white, rich or poor, God sees us as his beloved children, each one of us. And we're invited so powerfully to stop comparing ourselves to others and look directly at the man in the mirror. Confident in how God made us. And this idea got me thinking a lot this week. Not only does God not show favoritism when it comes to our gifts, talents, and abilities, but what about those with disabilities? You want to know what I believe? I believe people born with disabilities have unique gifts and talents beyond any of our understanding. I think that God knitted them together so beautifully to witness in a way that we never could. And our passion as a church, maybe some of you don't know this, but every single month, many of us from Neroten travel to New Canaan to Grace Farms, and we have youth group for the disabled. Because there's a conviction in my heart that the only disability in life is a bad attitude. I look forward to it every single month. And next Friday, February 7th, you should know that our church is involved in a global event called Night to Shine, a Tim Tebow-sponsored event. It's where individuals with disabilities go to prom together, and it is going to be awesome. <laughs> Tully's going to be there. I can't wait, buddy. We do ties together. We paint nails. We do hair, we pray. And we elevate and watch the beauty of this group of amazing students. And so in this spirit of uniquely being made, I, I gotta share with you a poem that was written by a young boy named Benjamin Giroux. You see, Benjamin's a 10-year-old boy from Plattsburgh, New York, who has Asperger's disorder. It's a type of chemical imbalance. He was given a school task and he was approached to create a lyric titled, I Am. And I think that this young boy has a serious message for us this morning. Because you see, guys, Benjamin might not be able to express his emotions, but he was excited about this assignment. His mom and dad said he sat down at the kitchen table and he didn't lift his head until he was done writing. When he finished the poem, he showed it to his mom and his teachers, and they were overwhelmed with emotion. The poem has since gone viral and been translated into 20 different languages. The title of the poem is called, I Am Odd, I Am New. Let's hear the words. I am odd. I am new. I wonder if you are too. I hear voices in the air. I, I see you don't, and well, that's not fair. I want to not feel blue. I am odd. I am new. I pretend that you are too. I feel like a boy in outer space. I touch the stars and I feel out of place. I worry what others might think. I cry when people laugh. It makes me shrink. I am odd. I am new. I understand now that so are you. I say I feel like a castaway. I dream of a day that that's okay. I try to fit in. I hope that someday I do because I am odd. I am new. What a gift we received from this uniquely gifted boy. I wonder what your I am lyric looks like. One thing's for certain. 
Whatever it is, it is of the utmost importance to God. And one of the ways that makes us all unique is that we all need God's grace in our lives. Okay, let's finish. Verses 12 through 16. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciousness also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. Okay, guys, so... This section of scripture, Paul is unpacking righteousness in these verses. Remember, he's dealing with the people who think they're chosen, and, and he's got some bad news for the Jews and actually for all of us. Because what he says to us is that righteousness is not possible for any man or woman to attain on his or her own. The standard is way too high. But the good news he's bringing to the people is that true righteousness is possible for humankind. It is possible. But only through the cleansing of sin by Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Paul's writing from his heart because he cares so much about the people. And he's not writing to condemn them, but to explain the gospel. That the power of God to save and make us righteous is through Jesus. So Paul thoroughly tears down any arguments that tries to counter it. So much so that he states that God already knows all our secrets. What? I read that, I was like, what? You know, in recovery, there's a saying that goes like this. You're only as sick as your secrets. Secrets are poisoning. And they keep people hidden and in bondage. And in chains to sin. And Paul is saying, because of the cross, because of Calvary, every human being that walks this earth if they have faith in Jesus, can be saved by grace alone, and there is zero we can do to earn it, and our shame, and our guilt, and our pain, and our doubt, and our fear doesn't stand a chance. He's saying that even the darkest secrets of our hearts were taken for us by Christ on the cross. That is a profound message. So let's imitate Paul's letter this morning and ask ourselves some questions, really important questions. Did we walk into Christ's church this morning seeking to learn or to just listen? Did we walk into Christ's church seeking to be challenged and changed or to just cruise through life as best as we can? Did we walk into Christ's church to face the reality of our fallen nature or have we figured it all out already? In Romans chapter 2 verses 1 through 16, I think Paul was addressing a group of people that didn't want to learn. They certainly didn't want to be challenged and definitely felt in some conscious way that they were better than other people because they knew how to follow the rules. Do you know anybody like that? I'm curious. Have you ever had the pleasure of spending time with a judgmental egomaniac? It's like the one thing that gets me fired up in life. It really does. My guess is 
If you have, then you understand the boldness and assertiveness of Paul's teaching this morning. He's flat out questioning people, unapologetically. He's saying hypocritical judgment we all possess and is calling us all out to keep our eyes on the man in the mirror. That is always the reflection that will be the hardest for each of us to face. So let me close the sermon with some lyrics of one of my favorite songs. It's recorded by Michael Jackson and it's called Man in the Mirror. I want to get up here and sing it and moonwalk across the chancel, but I won't. <laughs> Could you imagine if I moonwalked? <laughs> Darianne News, preacher moonwalks. Here's what the lyrics say. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. Take a look at yourself and make a change. The only issue I have with Michael Jackson is that he left out the most important part, how we actually change. And we change by repenting and turning our hearts to Jesus. Does the mirror we look into reflect the love and freedom of Christ? Or the judgment and harshness of mere mortals? Remember guys, we, we walk out of this place, we may be the only living example of the Bible somebody ever sees. The question Paul has challenged us to grapple with this week is that if somebody watched us closely and particularly the way we view others, would they want to read the Bible or reject it? I hope if somebody watches you closely this week, they'll want to open their Bible and learn more about a merciful God, a loving God, a truthful God that transforms, heals, equips, and blesses each and every one of us to share a message that changes everything. What a message, church. Amen. What a gift. Amen.